Y'all can grab a seat. How you doing? Just, I uh, just want to remind you all that in July it was like one billion degrees for a month straight. So we can deal with, let's see, like 13 degrees for a little bit. It is frigid out there. Uh, but hey, thank you for fighting the cold. It's nice and cozy in here, and thank you for being here. If you're joining us online, I don't know, you guys might be the smart ones this morning. Um, but either way, we're glad that you are with us online, and we're certainly glad that you're here with us in the room. And so I, I want to make kind of a, a, a drastic uh I don't know, transition and, and kind of let you guys in on a, a difficult season that, uh, that, that I kind of walked through maybe 10 or so uh, years ago. But, but basically, the short of it is, is, is I was in a season where, where I felt uh, strangely exhausted. And I say strangely exhausted because it wasn't like a normal kind of exhaustion from lack of sleep or, or anything like that. But, but really, it was an exhaustion that led to sort of a numbness and a detachment, and a numbness and a detachment, particularly from, from places like this, right? I, I would go to church on Sunday mornings and, and, and I wouldn't really feel anything. It, it just felt like I was, I was going through sort of motions. I, I would sing songs and worship like we just did, but it just seemed like the words kept falling flat and had little, if any, meaning to me in that particular season. And I would been a Christ follower for many years. And what I really found is that what I held most sacredly was becoming painfully routine. And I would find myself going to bed most nights asking God, why, why isn't this working like it used to? And really that season led me to, to, the, to the conviction and the belief that, that how we view God and our threat of how we view God is one of the enemies, or to threaten how we view God, is one of the enemy's great, great attacks. And in that season, where my faith was motionless, it was really was full of motion, was affectionateless, I had lost visibility of who God really was. A.W. Tozer says, what comes into our mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. And I, I think that's pretty spot on. We're in a series called This First Changed My Life, and we're really wrapping up the series today. And it's been really fun to participate in this series because really what we get to do is, is we get to kind of share some personal stories, some testimony of how God has used different passages of scripture in different seasons to really transform and change us. And this morning, I wanna look at Luke 15, and particularly a familiar passage and the parable son, because that is the passage of scripture that the Lord really used in the season I was just mentioning to bring about a refreshed and rejuvenated picture of who he really was and what he is like. And so this morning, as we get ready to dive in, if, if you find yourself in a season where maybe you feel a little numb, maybe you feel a little detached from your faith. Again, you feel like you're going through the motions. And my hope and my prayer for you is that the Lord would use this passage like he used in my own journey, and that as we look at some of the attributes of who God is, you would find yourself refreshed and that you would fall deeper in love with who the Father is. So, we ready to jump in? Let's look at, let's look at Luke 15, starting in verse 11. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Well, one of the questions uh, I've always had about this passage, and it's a little bit of a question that's impossible to know because it's a parable, which means it's a story that didn't actually happen, but Jesus would use it as sort of a teaching illustration to point to a larger truth. But if it were a real story, I would want to know what is it that drove this prodigal son to make such an audacious request? And we'll get into the implications of the request in just a minute. But if I had to guess what made the prodigal make such a bold request is probably that he was plagued by a wondering imagination with a little sprinkle of boredom. 
I mean, if you think about it, he would have likely woken up day in, day out, right? And and very possibly done the same thing over and over, some sort of manual labor tasking. There's a good chance, or, or you can all but picture him, maybe by himself in a field left with just his wondering thoughts, daydreaming about what life must be like on the other side of the property line. Until one day, he can no longer stand to just daydream. And so he trades his imagination for his reality and he plays the one and the only card that he has. Give me my share of the estate. Kenneth Bailey, who's a a scholar, was a scholar theologian, wrote a a fantastic little commentary on the prodigal son and particularly Luke 15. And, And in it, he helps us understand in that culture what, it w- what would have been implied by the prodigal son requesting his share of the estate. He says that the request communicates the desire of the young son for his father to die, which makes sense. Typically, an estate is not split up until death is either impending or the patriarch, in this case, has died. To suddenly lose part of the family estate would be a staggering loss. The parable specifically states that the prodigal settled his affairs in a few days, meaning he liquidated his assets in a hurry, which in turn indicates a sell at any price. So it would have been staggering financial loss for the family. And then third, there is no trust. The son takes his destiny into his own hands. He seems to feel that his father can no longer be trusted to direct his life. In six words, the prodigal son, deliberately wounds his father and attempts to break off all ties with his family and his community. But the father doesn't have to oblige. I know that I'm a, a parent in, in a, probably a different life stage than, than what this guy would have been in. And, and if you're a parent of any life stage, you get this. Your kids make ridiculous requests all the time that you routinely turned down, right? Like, hey, dad, can we have a donut for dinner? No, of course not. Your mom's right there. Like, come on, man. We don't do that with her around. (laughs) And and, and so the father, he, he would have been well within his rights to refuse this request. He was under no legal obligation to give him his share of the estate until he died. And yet notice his response. So he divided the property between them. Which begs the question, why? Why would the father give him his share of the estate? And and I think this is where we we maybe arrive at at the first attribute that we can see about God's character in Luke 15. And it's that he is not an authoritarian lover. Now, speaking of my kids, my older son, very much an authoritarian lover when it comes to his little brother. In fact, almost all displays of affection are forceful, and I think we have a picture, usually are a hug that turns into a stranglehold. Okay, I know that's not a great picture, but you can also see he's smiling because he thinks he's, yeah, look, I love him, while I choke him out. (laughs) But the father in this parable, he's not an authoritarian lover. He, He has no interest in keeping his son around so that he can go through the motions of affection. C.S. Lewis writes, he cannot ravish, he can only woo. And and if we liken the father, if we liken the father in this parable to Jesus, which we should, and we will do often this morning, then, then Jesus, God himself, would have been well within his rights to ravish us into a almost robotic like creature that are pre-programmed with an automated response to love him. Problem with that, that's not genuine love. That's not authentic love. That's, that's calculated, programmed love. But he can woo us. He can woo us by revealing his heart to us so that as we see more and more of him, as we get a better and better glimpse of just how loving and compassionate our heavenly Father is, we fall deeper and deeper into his presence, into his character. And and to choose authentic 
love would have meant that God had to remain open to rejection. And certainly, we get that. People routinely reject God. People routinely ask for their estate. And he gives it because he's not an authoritarian lover. Look at verse 13. It says that not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. And so, our boy, he gets what it is that he wants so badly, he's got his back to his family and to his old life, and his eyes are set on his new horizon. And I'm sure that that as he made his way into the distant land, it was better than he could have imagined. He, He probably experienced newfound freedoms, he probably experienced Uh, new people who didn't know his old life, and a new community. I'm sure it was awesome until it wasn't. And then some circumstances that he was ill-equipped to navigate on his own arrive at his doorstep. Look at what it says in verses 14 and 16. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to the fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. So I wonder if at this point, if this is when our guy starts daydreaming again, right? My guess is is that as he is sitting there in the field with the pigs, He's probably not daydreaming about the distant land anymore. He's pretty well seen how that plays out. But maybe maybe he started to wonder. Maybe the thought popped in his head, you know, the love and the acceptance that I so desperately sought here in the distant land, which I believe is ultimately what he was looking for. Maybe as I'm confronted with my very present reality, which is a Jewish man with an unclean animal, pigs in a field so hungry I'm considering eating their food, as I consider my present reality, maybe the love that I was looking for, maybe it was back home in my father's house. Maybe the acceptance that I craved was back there in my community. And the second attribute that we really see about the character of God in this passage is that his love is sufficient. And when you know the love of the Father, the love of the distant land, it'll no longer cut it. It reminds me of on Sunday afternoons when I was growing up, we used to go to this barbecue place called Coulter's. Anyone remember Coulter's? Yeah, John Hinton does, that's right. <laughs> there, there was one in Valley View Mall. Anyone remember Valley View Mall? Just talking about all the relics of Dallas. But we would go to Coulter's, and in my little seven, eight-year-old mind, I mean, I thought it was as good as barbecue could get, right? You would just drown the brisket in barbecue sauce. Okay, and it was awesome. Apparently, even uh, if you brought a church bulletin, you got a free drink, right? And, And it was great until, guess what happened? I had good barbecue. I had like wait in line all morning, barbecue in a small town, possibly smoked by the local high school's janitor kind of good barbecue. That was, a, that was a real inside ball for those of you barbecue nerds. And once I had a good barbecue, what happened to Coulter's? Psh, like, it, it just didn't get the job done anymore. For I had tasted and seen just how gloriously wonderful a cow can be prepared, and there was no turning back. <laughs> and, and I say that because... Perhaps, perhaps you love the world and all the trinkets of the world a little too much because you either don't know or, or you have forgotten that, that there's a love that you have been created for. There is a love available that will fill every single longing of your soul. But, but when you lose visibility of the Father, like I did, you find yourself settling for a cheap imitation of that love. And maybe it's a a job that that you thought was perfect and and you thought for sure I will put in this extra time, these hours, I will compromise a thing here or there if I need to because I know that this job will love me back and it did love you until it also fired you. 
And then you're left wondering, well, that didn't, that didn't love me back very well. Or maybe it's a relationship and you are head over heels for this guy or for this girl and things are going great until one day she drops the I think we should see other people bomb. And suddenly that love isn't loving you back anymore. And let me just remind you, if, if you feel like as you sort of take some inventory of, of the things that you are affectionate for in your life right now, if there seems to be some, some false loves in there, or at least some loves that, that you're expecting to satisfy your deepest, longest cravings, which can only be found in the love of the Father, if you're looking for something else there, then, then let me just remind you that you have been created with an appetite to love the Father. And once you have tasted and seen just how good he is, anything else that you taste, it's just not the same. Your palate has been ruined forever by the love of the Father. His love is sufficient. So, verse 17, y'all doing all right? Yeah, that was, someone said yeah, it was, so, it was very kind. Very, that made me feel good. Verse 17, when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. And so here's where we're at. The prodigal's daydreaming is starting to turn into rationalizing and strategizing, okay? He's gonna come up with a plan. And that plan begins with the realization that even back at my father's house, the servants, the servants have enough food to eat or to spare, right? And so the problem is though, he's cashed it all in, right? He, he can daydream about going home as much as he wants, but when he made that decision to leave, I'm pretty sure he figured that was a sort of all or in kind of decision and that there would be no going back, right? But the fact that he's even considering this as a possibility shows you how far this young prodigal has descended. And even at the bottom, I mean, at rock bottom, he still doesn't understand the love of his father. Because look, look what happens next in verse 18. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. You wanna know what I really think caused this prodigal to take his journey into the distant land? I think it's that he figured he would never be worthy of the love of his father. And at this point, he still thinks that because even his new strategy is totally misguided and led by his abilities to attain or earn something. Maybe I can go back and I can say all the right things to my father and I can at least prove myself, I can prove my work good enough to at least be welcomed back as a servant. Right? I think with enough hard work and grit, I can possibly pull myself out of the muck and the mire and the field with the pigs and maybe I can prove that I at least have enough to offer for a servant in my father's house. Right? I can white knuckle this. And, and, and that's the rationalization, that's the senses that it says that he comes to. And, and frankly, I think that's the rationalization that a lot of us come to. I, I know for me that when I found myself in a season of just feeling like my faith wasn't really working, the first thing that I was, I was tempted to do, I, and frankly was honestly told to do, but by some people was, was just to like dive in even deeper, right? To, to, man, you read your Bible once a day, try like three times a day, okay? You, you go to church once a week, try like three times a week, go to church more, you gotta, you gotta white knuckle, you've gotta do enough things so that maybe, just maybe, you can show yourself worthy enough for God's affection. If you do enough thing, if you put in enough hard work, then maybe, just maybe, God will see you. The problem with that and the problem with this young prodigal is that there is no amount of hard work. There is no amount of striving. There is no consecutive day streak on the Bible app that's ever gonna earn you any more of God's love. 
And look, reading your Bible, man, showing up to here to worship, your soul thrives on that. I cannot downplay the importance of that, okay? It's vital, but it does not make God love you anymore. You gotta understand that, right? And here's the thing. A lot of times we're, we're, we're a little bit better for those of you who are Christ followers saying like, okay, yeah, there's, there's nothing I can do to earn. Like I, I get that, you know, uh, faith by, or grace by faith alone. Sure, sure, sure. There's nothing, I, there's no merit, right? But let me flip that coin. You know, there's also nothing you can do to, to get less of God's love, to lose his love, right? It's a two-sided coin. There's nothing you can do to earn and there's also nothing that will cause you to lose the love of your father. And that's the, the next attribute of God, the third attribute that, that we see in this passage, and it's that his love cannot be earned, nor can it be lost. Verse 20. But what, oh, excuse me, I almost misread. So he got up and went to his father. And so obviously, this is a parable, right? So we don't, we don't know uh, exactly how far away the distant land was, but since it was called a distant land, I think it's safe to assume that it was a pretty good distance away. And so I imagine that this, uh, this young prodigal probably had a, a good amount of time to journey back and to think and to be alone with his thoughts. And if you're like me and, and you've got any extended amount of time in the car, uh, I usually begin to daydream and just to, to sort of, wherever I'm headed or whatever I'm going to do, I begin to play that scenario out in my head and the possible outcomes that could happen. And, and I think that's probably exactly what he was doing. He probably started to imagine, you know, what is it gonna be like whenever I arrive in the community, whenever I arrive at the gate, at the entrance? He probably thought, you know, I bet Whenever I get there, they'll, they'll start to see me walking down the road. And then when they notice it's me, some of the men will rush through the village to the gate, to the entrance, and they'll probably block me from, from coming in. And, and then I, I'm guessing that they're gonna go get a big piece of pottery and they're gonna begin the kazaza. See, the kazaza was a ritual and Jewish traditions like this in which if a member of the community had abandoned the community, particularly to live amongst Gentiles and attempted to return, the ritual was that they would break a large piece of pottery into thousands of pieces, symbolizing that the relationship between this wayward prodigal and his community is broken. It's no more. And then they would shout, kazaza, kazaza, which literally means cut off. You're cut off, you're not welcome here. We are not your people anymore. You gotta go somewhere else. This isn't your home. And I, I wonder if I'm him, if he, he thought about just turning around. I mean, what's the point? He knew what he had done. He knew the gravity of his request for the estate, what's even the point? But I wonder if around the same time, if in the community, something else is happening. And maybe there's a father way up on a hill. And you know when you, 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 see, you think you, you see something, but, but you're, you feel like your eyes like, oh, that, that can't be it. it there's no way, that, that does look like my son though. And as he gets closer, that's, that's my son. I don't know why, but picture one of the servants with the father and says, sir, do you, do you want me to get the, the jars for the kazaza ritual? Sir, the jars? No, 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 sorry, we, we, don't, we don't need the jars. We're not gonna be doing that kazaza ceremony. And then what happens, it's so unusual, it's hard for us to understand in our context, but I'm gonna try and help us. But what happens next 
is the father runs, right? It says in, we'll just go ahead and read verse 20. It says, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The final thing, the final attribute of the character of God is that he is unashamed by his love for you. Kenneth Bailey, who I just mentioned, says that in the Middle East, a man of his age and position always walks in a slow, dignified passion. It is safe to assume that he has not run anywhere for any purpose for 40 years. And not to mention, for a man in, in, in this context, in this culture, for him to run in his traditional Jewish attire, he would have had, obviously, like a robe like shindig on, and he would have had to pick that up revealing his legs, which is just as, if not more shameful, than him to be running. And so now he's running with his legs totally exposed to his entire community. Everyone would have been shocked in what they see, completely humiliated. But in this moment, if I had to guess, this father, you know what he's not thinking about? Cultural norms the humiliation, the shame. He's thinking about his boy. His son that he thought was gone forever is coming home. I don't care if I look shameful. You can humiliate me. I wanna get to my boy as fast as I can because that's all that matters right now. And in such a similar fashion, when we come to the Lord, no matter how long we've been out in the fields with the pigs in the distant land, when we come to the Lord, he runs towards us. He doesn't run away from us. He doesn't back away from us and say, well, you've run off three times in the last three years, so I don't really know if I might have to give you a slow approach. No, he runs. He runs. It doesn't matter how many times we wonder, his response is always the same. And the world might say, you really think God could keep on loving someone like you with how many times you've made the same mistake? You still think that that whole God business works for you? You still think that he could have time for a wretch like you? Yeah, if you're a son, if you're a daughter, he always will, and he'll always come running. And so, verses 21 through 24 say, we're not gonna get to finish this passage, which is unfortunate because there's some, uh, there's some good drama with the older brother, so you should take a look at that later. But verses 21 through 24, we're almost done. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate for the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, so they begin to celebrate. So the prodigal launches in to his prepared speech. But before he can even finish, it looks like the father interrupts him to begin the necessary preparations for celebration. And it says that, that the father gave him a ring and that ring would have likely had the family signet on it. it. Would have kind of been the family ring. And him wearing that ring in the community and at the celebration would have told any and everyone that this young prodigal has been fully restored as a son to the father. Full restoration. And here is where we arrive at the great plot twist of this parable, and honestly, the plot twist of the gospel. And it's that simply your life and your decisions will never prove the love of Christ, but his life will. And so there's no action, there's no striving, there's no, there's no merit, all the verbs fall to Jesus and what he was subjected to on the cross. The shame that he bore for your sins. And so as we get ready to take communion and to respond, for those of you who have a relationship with God, 
but maybe you're exhausted, you, you feel detached, you feel like you show up here and you do all the same things, but it just doesn't work the way that it used to. Perhaps at some point you begin to view your father as someone that he wasn't. You, you begin to view your father as a judge who was mad at you, shaming you, making you feel small, and so your view of God became small. Maybe you are convinced that God it must be this, this angry sort of uh, judge-like character who's just always looking at his watch, tapping his foot anytime you try and pray, hoping that you would just hurry your way out of his presence so that he could get on and talk to the, the good Christians. I mean, maybe your view of God is, is that he's given up on you and he's given up on your struggle. Oh, Pierce, yeah, I just, whatever. He's always gonna do that thing, this thing. He's always gonna struggle with that. Maybe you think God has just kind of given up on you. Wherever you're at, the response this morning is simply to remember that this, this parable, you know who it's not about? It's not about the, the prodigal. It's not about what he did in the distant land. It's about what the father did. And your life, your life is not about what you've done. It's about what the father has done. And, and I know that this can be really hard for us to do, but if, if you're thinking and obsessing over your past and certain mistakes you made, you're thinking about yourself too much. Stop trying to upstage Jesus and the grand narrative of the gospel. He's center stage on the cross. Okay, I'm not saying the, the weight of sin is very real, but if you think that it has the ability to get in the way of the gospel and what was made manifest, the love that was manifest on that cross, you have completely bought in to a lie about God. Your sin and your past, it will never get in the way of the love that Christ has for you. And so to respond, man, fall deeply, fall deeply in to the love that the Father has for you. It's unceasing, it's unending, it's bottomless. You can drink it in as much as you want. The Father is telling you, inviting you to come and to share in his presence and, and don't hurry. He doesn't want you to hurry. You're not, you're not a, a burden. You're a delight to the Father. Stay as long as you want. Drink it in as much as you want. We're, we're gonna take communion. So if you wanna start to get your little wafer out, and as we get ready to take communion, where do you feel undeserving, unlovable? Where do you feel like you're not worthy? Whatever it is, take the wafer, look at it, and remember that this is the body of Christ broken for you so that you never have to wonder just how far the Father went to prove his love to you. So take and eat. Take the juice. Excuse me. Look at that juice. That symbolizes the blood of Christ that was shed on the cross. And because of that blood, you never, ever have to wonder again if you've got the love of Christ. When that blood was shed, it proved to you that he will always come running after you. So take and drink. We're gonna respond in worship in just a minute. But if, if you didn't know that there was a God that could have this volume of love for you, that would be willing to send his son to the cross, then we would love to have a conversation with you about how you can know the King of Kings, Jesus. And, and he laid down his life for you as we just talked about. 
to show just how far he was willing to go for you. And he wants you. He really does. I believe that with every fiber of my being, that he wants you. And he wants you this morning, and he wants to have a relationship with you. So if that's a decision you want to make, when we respond in worship, you can head back to that next step room. Let's continue.